Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live as well as Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And we're going to be having a incredible uh, biblical insight message today. I think it's the best way to start out the new year with some good news. So for those of you that like uh, watching our news on Israeli News Live, we're going to have to do a little bit of good news today, friends. Uh, it is a biblical insight as well. As you can probably see, I have over a dozen passages I have lined up. Uh, so if, if you're not here for that and you just want news only, you might want to skip this broadcast. I think it would do you some incredibly good to watch it. Um, and also, I'd like to... Uh, uh, just remind you, those of you that like to support the work we do, you can do so. Those of you that do not like to do it online at IsraeliNewsLive.org, you can mail us here in the United States now. We have both our mailboxes in Europe as, as well as in the United States. Uh, of course, our P.O. box there in the Czech Republic at, uh, uh, of course, that's P.O. box 46. Uh, 15006 Praha 56, Czech Republic. Those of you that uh, like to help contribute that are in Europe, make, make it easier there. In the United States, it's Danoon Institute, and that's at 8297 Champions Gate, uh, number 442, Champions Gate, Florida 33896. We thank you for your love and help in keeping this broadcast going. A uh, little bit of uh, admonishment here this morning I want to start off with, mainly because there just always ends up being misunderstandings. And I guess if you don't have a chance to talk to someone individually, it makes it even uh, more easy to misunderstand someone. But the other day we did this in-depth broadcast where we mention as well in the broadcast uh, some of the historical value of what happened in World War II with Russia's leader, uh, Vladimir, uh, excuse me, uh, Joseph Stalin and his help to the United States in World War II. Uh, inevitably, some people, had a couple of people actually comment, say, I can't believe you're glorifying Stalin. I, I am definitely not glorifying Stalin by no means. Glor Stalin had enough evil of his own hand, uh, even though they did rescue many Jews during the Holocaust there, but Stalin also has a lot of blood on his hand of the Jews himself. And I've brought that out many times on Israeli News Live because my own father-in-law's father, was taken by Stalin's men, uh, was taken to Siberia, never seen again. In fact, his mother waited to the day she died as an old woman, always sitting at the door, her chair facing the door, because he promised her when they took him that he would return one day. Uh, very, very touching story there, but it just kind of goes back, and I just want to say this with love from my heart. Uh, the vision the Lord showed me when I was 18 years old Jesus himself, Yeshua, actually came to me in a vision. And he told me, man hears more often than he listens. I wondered for years what he meant by that statement until he finally revealed the vision to me and said, the people will hear, but they won't listen. And that would be more often. Uh, and I find that very so much true. Unless you've listened to so many of the videos that we have done there, uh, we may not say everything in one video, but the point we were making with the, with the case of Stalin the other day was that he did ally with the United States. He helped the U.S. after he'd lost 20 million people with, uh, against Japan. Uh, to defeat J the Japanese uh, after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, so we were only pointing out the fact that we can have a peaceful relationship with Russia if it weren't for the fact that there is someone else involved in these governments and behind the scenes. Uh, so anyway, with that, without any further ado, let's get into this. I want to thank Brother Conrad, a very good friend of mine uh, on our Facebook page there. We have stayed in touch over the years here, but he sent me this video of Rabbi Glazerson. And I, I don't know Rabbi Glazerson personally, although we have emailed before uh, about Bible codes. And I'm not into Bible codes as a, as a tool for prophecy. I do want to say that and make that clear. I do believe that there's no doubt that God has hid things in the Bible codes. But I've also watched to a very sad uh, situation to where they have become a tool for prophecy. And so many times because uh, those that do Bible codes, uh, with no doubt good intentions, uh, if they're not careful, those codes don't happen. And rather than making it more clear to the public, it's not a prophetic tool, uh, it causes a, a lot of uh, anxiety 
amongst those uh, viewers that watch this. And because uh, we have to remember, when God gives the laws for a prophet that prophesies, if he fails, if his prophecy fails, he was to be considered a false prophet. Uh, in Israel. And in fact, uh, that would actually be a life sentence. That's why I, I think it very seriously when we talk about things that are dealing with pr prophecy and nature. But nonetheless, I want to play just a, a, about a minute of Rabbi Glazerson talking about this latest code because this code here uh, supports the biblical prophecy of the return of Moses and Elijah. And uh, so, and I know there's all kinds of codes out there. There's even codes that people have put together that it's Enoch and, and Elijah, etc. Uh, but I know that Rabbi Glazerson is respected by some of the top uh, uh, code searchers in, in America here as well. He's very respected by them. Uh, and I want to point out something, though, that Rabbi Glazerson is not going to point out in this code. So let's take a look at what he says here. Messiah of God is coming, amazing, once in the Torah, and his woman will come with Elijah, exactly with Elijah, this is what is written. Now, the word of Israel will come to Israel with Moses, because they want to our tradition, Moses will come with Elijah together. Now, what I found it unbelievable is many of the Torah like a question, who is Shechim, where are who are the Messiahs in plural, because we have two of son of Joseph, we have son of Jesse, and Elijah will come with them. So interesting, you have here really this. Now, I'm going to pause it there. I will put the video up on the links here. I'll make it the first one in the links here for you to look at. Uh, so that you can listen to his entire uh, com uh, comments about this. But I also wanted to take for a moment and share with you uh, uh, what Rabbi Glazerson is actually saying here. Uh, and of course, you can see his channel here, uh, Mitayahu Glazerson. This was published on December the 28th, 2017. Messiah 5778 of God's Son of Jesse comes 5778 Bible Code Glazerson is the title of that particular video. And uh, very interesting in my opinion. And when he mentions on here, uh, the, uh, the two, the, the, at the top of there, he goes in here, uh, May, Mishachim, which is who are the messiahs, you can also take that as a question because the word uh, mas, uh, Mashiach is also the word used for anointed because Messiah means anointed one. Okay, so Mi Mishachim is even more powerful in this biblical code because literally what is the question asking? Who are the anointed ones? That's really the way it is. Now, Rabbi Glazerson not thinking about the fact that there are two witnesses coming because we know this from Revelation uh, chapter 11, which we're going to get into in just a moment about these two witnesses. So he's not thinking of it that way because he automatically knows that Elijah's coming according to Malachi's prophecy, chapter 3. In English, it's chapter 4, but in, in the... Uh, for the Jewish people, it's actually chapter 3. We have no chapter 4 in the, in the Hebrew version of Malachi. Uh, but it is all the same verses are in chapter 3 that you have in chapter 4. We just separated it in the English Bible there. Uh, but then he goes into that. He says right here that they are, that, that uh, Mashiach, Mem Shin Yod Chet, okay? And then it's got the divine name of God, Yod He Vav He, which he calls Hashem, okay? Ba, Bet, Aleph right here. Okay, so the Messiah of God is coming, okay, then Im Eliyahu with Elijah to Israel with Moses as he points out. So I think it's even more fascinating because in his code he actually asks the question, who are the anointed ones? Well, it's Moses and Elijah coming uh, with God to the Messiah, or with the Messiah to Israel. All right, to Israel, la Yisrael. What an incredible code that is. Now, of course, he's questioning whether or not it would actually be this year that we're coming into now. Uh, would they actually come this year? That's part of the way his code works out here. So that question is being presented. So, but nonetheless, because of his code that he's doing, it has really made me want to take, and let's look once again at the two witnesses. And I know, and listen, friends, if you believe it's Elijah and Enoch, I'm not against that. 
I really am not against that whatsoever. Uh, and so I don't mean it when I bring out the part about Moses because I really feel like there are scriptures that he has never fulfilled in his own life. And even the rabbis know it. And as well as Rashi, the famed biblical Torah commentator from about a thousand years ago, he also noted in his own writings that Moses would be back during the Messianic age. He notes that because of Exodus 15. We're going to get into that in just a little bit here. Uh, but most people use the, the New Testament verse where it says it's appointed unto man once to die, then after this the judgment to justify why Moses can't return. I've been over this a thousand times and yet still people do not listen. As the Lord said to me, they will hear but they will not listen. And so I just can't encourage you enough. Really listen to what the scripture says in this case here because that whole chapter, Paul is speaking specifically about Yeshua as the Messiah and that he was appointed only one time to die, not multiple times. And it should be obvious to us as well, like Lazarus. Lazarus, he raised up. Lazarus died anyway a second time. Of course, people like to say, well, there's no scripture that he died the second time. If he didn't die the second time, can you tell me where he is then? Because I'd like to go shake his hand and greet him farewell. All right, use some common sense, friends. Follow the scripture and what the passage and what Paul says, that is specifically only applied to Yeshua, that he would have to die and he would only die once, all right? Now, as we move on, let's go real quick here because there's a lot of ground to cover here. We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 11 starts off, And there was given me a reed likened to a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years. Now, that kind of sets the stage for us as, as far as what's going to happen. And when I say that, what I'm talking about here is that the temple, the third temple itself, the measuring of that temple, the, those that would worship therein and leave out the outer court, it's given unto the Gentiles, that fits biblically perfect, perfectly with what Rabbi Yehuda Glick said to Paul Begley that they're going to build the third temple on the Temple Mount next to the Dome of the Rock and in the middle between the Dome of the Rock and the Temple they're going to make a library for all nations the court without leave out for it's given unto the Gentiles and they shall tread the holy city for uh, three and a half years okay and that clearly also is prop not only is it prophesied but that's exactly what the vatican wants they want to be given the holy city under a un mandate the vatican is to to safeguard the old city of jerusalem and that will be biblical prophecy being fulfilled but what happens at the same time that this goes on then he says in verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now I want you to notice something right here. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. That tells me they're already here. Because he gives them power, that means they must be here, but they don't have the power as of yet. Now, Think about that one for a moment. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. That doesn't mean uh, that a ball of fire comes out of their mouth. But what they say will take place. Remember what happened in the days of Elijah when they sent up the uh, 50 soldiers. And of course he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume thee. Out of his mouth he spoke it and then that fire came down and consumed him. Two times that happened. So that is clearly Elijah. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Again, Elijah. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. Moses had that gift. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Again, the ministry of Moses reincarnated on the earth again today. Now, I don't say, when I say reincarnate, I don't mean reincarnation. I'm talking about, the, in other words, the acts again are repeating. So please understand me. That's not uh, to mean reincarnation, but the acts that they did will be impersonated, I should say, once again, uh, but in the real, not as an impersonation as far as false. 
And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they, this is important that you don't miss this, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall, shall, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because the two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Don't forget that. That's so important because we're going to look at that as well in prophecy. Now there's a lot of scripture that goes with the two witnesses and I don't even have them all up here because I'm going to tell you things that you've never heard before uh, well, unless you've listened to Israeli News Live before. All right, so now we're going to take and we're going to go into Ezekiel's prophecy, looking at chapter 35, all right? Ezekiel chapter 35, starting with verse 7, Thus will I make Mount Sierra most desolate and cut off from it him that passeth through and him that returneth. By the way, Mount Sierra we can clearly identify in Obadiah as being Rome. Also the book of Daniel chapter 9 when it speaks about the prince that shall come. He would be what? Of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Alright, that prince that shall come is Esau's children and Obadiah identifies that when Obadiah says you were as one of them and he calls Esau by name. You were as one of them when they, they took your brother uh, Judah into captivity. And you were as one of them. And that's exactly what Titus, the Roman general, was. He was as one of them with the Syrian military to help ransack Jerusalem and destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's what Titus was doing. All right? So he was one of them. And all this calamity that has taken place, and as Daniel says, the prince that shall come, which is a future prince, was, will be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which again... Obadiah points out as Esau's descendants. So that prince that comes in modern days is also Esau's descendants. And I can take you to Daniel chapter 11 and prove this as well. Uh, and, and, and by the way, before I go any further, let me clarify one thing. When Yeshua died on this earth, of course we know he raised up. and went to be with the Lord, sitting on his right hand. But remember... When he left this earth, he, before he left, he read Isaiah 61, verse 1 and half of verse 2, and he left the other half off because why? It applied to his second coming. Don't you think that when he left this earth, the Romans were in control. They were in power. Got a bad itch on my back and driving me nuts, guys. So, anyway. So, the Romans were in control on the earth then, and of course, do you not think that the Romans would be in control once again when he returns? I mean, the whole stage is being set up the way it was 2,000 years ago. Rome was in control of Israel. There were Roman prefects over Israel. They had, uh, we had Pilate, for example, the governor. And Israel was all bowing down to the Roman authority. And Shimon Perez has set up Israel to be governed by the Vatican the same way it was 2,000 years ago. The only difference is, and Ariel Sharon signed the document making a two-state solution, which basically put a Roman prefect over the entire nation. The, the, the Israeli government gave land back to the Vatican from hundreds and hundreds of years ago that they were able to take over uh, after the Crusades, etc., and so we're seeing a stage set once again. Yes, we have an Israeli parliament. Yes, we have an Israeli government. And there is no doubt there are Jesuit infiltrators in that government processes as well. Now, how do you think Shimon Perez got in there? Shimon Perez in Yitzhak Rabin's autobiography actually mentions that he goes to a Jesuit school back in Poland. That seems a little bit odd, doesn't it, to you? So you don't think that there's not other Jesuits that possibly have infiltrated the government? There's no doubt there has. What was all this about the early days of the nation of Israel being started? And we had certain Jewish families that wanted to see Jerusalem liberated as well because it's part of our heritage. It is the capital of Israel. But instead, Moshe Sharit and, and, and Ben-Gurion 
They said, no, hands off, and are willing to kill our own people to make sure that the hands are taken off Jerusalem to be able to carry out the mandate of Pope Pius XII that Jerusalem would be an international city controlled by the Vatican with a United Nations force. But in 1967, there were some of those good, honest-to-goodness Jewish Israelis that would not allow Jerusalem just to be given over to Rome. But Moshe Dayan relinquished the Temple Mount back over because of the pressure of the world. Anyway, all this is supposed to happen. We know this. So let's get back on focus here. Very lengthy message. I apologize. So he goes on. He says, Thus will I make Mount Sierra most desolate and cut off from him, him that passeth through, him that returneth. That's those dignitaries that go in and out of the Vatican today. And I will fill his mountains with his slain, and thy hills, and thy valleys, and thy streams shall they fall with a slain with the sword. And I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return. And you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said, These two nations, these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it whereas the Lord was there. He's talking about the dividing of Israel, the Palestinian state and the Jewish state, and he says these two will be his. He's going to take it over anyway, right? Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I shall judge you. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are delayed desolate, they are given us to devour. Because Rome has been after Jerusalem ever since. So see, God has to say, The blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel. The mountains, he said, to let them record what was said. And you have magnified yourself against me with your mouth and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard it. Thus saith the Lord, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. When does the whole earth rejoice? Remember what we just said a moment ago in Revelation 11? When does the earth rejoice? And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Right at the death of the two witnesses. And not only that, Ezekiel says that he will make himself known to them at the time when the earth does rejoice. Two witnesses come. Messiah comes on the heel of the two witnesses. Makes sense now? Now, for those of you that are of the house of Israel, that are scattered abroad throughout the world still yet, you know, He promises for you to return as well. Now, what's interesting and what I find interesting is that though the house of Israel is returning and many of them are believers in Yeshua to begin with, yet He still finds fault with you. And let me show you why. Jeremiah chapter 30, 36, verse 17. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it with their way and by their doings. Their way before me was the uncleanliness of a woman, her impurity. Wherefore, I poured out my fury upon them for the blood which they had shed upon the land, because they had defiled it with their idols. And I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way, according to their doings. I judged them. He kept fighting against Syria. When Jacob had made a covenant with Laban, who, by the way, the mothers of Israel are Syrians. Leah, Rachel, and both their handmaids are the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. But yet we could not see fit to live in peace and keep the covenant that was given between Laban and Yaakov, Jacob. And when they came into the nations, whether they came, they profaned my holy name, and that men said of them, These are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. The mere fact that the house of Israel has been scattered to the, to the four winds of the earth shows that God's name has been profaned. It's as if God can't keep his own word. 
But I had pity upon for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, whether they came. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations, whether you came. And I will sanctify my great name which hath been profaned among the nations which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall sanctify, be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will make you, take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and I will bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep mine ordinances and do them. That's the house of Israel. Not the house of Judah. Remember, Zechariah says that the house of Judah will return home first, that the house of Israel does not lift up its foot against it. You know why it says that the house of Israel would not lift up its foot against it? Because the house of Israel are mostly believers of Yeshua. And that's a good thing that they believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But the problem is, is you don't know truly what the truth is of Yeshua. This is why you have thousands of denominations and none of them can agree with one or the other. No wonder why God says he has to send two witnesses. It's not only for the sake of the house of Judah, but it's also for the sake of the house of Israel that is so messed up in doctrinal differences it's not even funny. So God's got to straighten it out. And in fact, by the way, do you know that the Lord's prayer is the prayer of Ezekiel 36? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctify your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Okay, so how do you sanctify God's name? When God gets you and he brings you to the promised land. That's a, that's a sanctification. All right, now, also, let me remind you. Um, mm, but before I go to Isaiah 52, let me take you real quick to Micah. Again, I bring this out because so many times people that listen to Israeli News Live, some people are saying, oh, you're so against Israel now. You used to be for Israel. I've always been for Israel. Never have I been against Israel. Am I against the Jesuit influence that comes inside the nation that allows gay parades in the city of Jerusalem or even in Tel Aviv? Do you think I'm going to stand for that? Absolutely not. Do you think I'm going to stand to see that Israel breaks the covenants that we have made biblically when God has commanded us that this is where we belong and this is what belongs to us and we should not go further than that? No, I will not stand for that. Do you think that the prophets of old, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, any of them ever stood any differently? Were they so well beloved of the children of Israel? No, they were hated and murdered. Isaiah sawn in half. Because they call out against the government. Micah does no different. And that day saith the Lord, will I assemble her. Micah chapter 4 verse 6. Her that, uh, that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. Alright? That is the lame. That is the ones coming from the Holocaust. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a mighty nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from thenceforth even forevermore. And thou, Migdal Eder, the heel of the daughter of Zion. In other words, thou, the leaders of Israel. Unto thee shall it come, yea, the former dominion shall come to the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished that pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail? Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city and shalt dwell in the field and shalt come even to Babylon. There shalt thou be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So Babylon is your enemy. And it is the heel of Migdal Eder, the leaders of Israel that have gone to Babylon, that have made a covenant that brought Rome back into power, that reset the cycle once again, so that the coming of Yeshua when he comes, Rome again will still be over you. The children of Israel wanted, wanted uh, Yeshua to deliver them from the hand of the Romans. Well, he's going to, don't worry. 
But you got to reset the stage again, and that's where we're at now. The stage is being reset. All right, Isaiah chapter 52. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto, the, unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise, and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from thy bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Captive daughter of Zion? For thus saith the Lord, you were sold for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Yeah. Shimon Perez sold you out. Did you get anything for it? Have you gotten anything for it from any of the other government leaders that have continued to sell it out, even Ariel Sharon, that have sold out Israel? You got sold for nothing. But you'll be redeemed without money as well. Through the Mashiach. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what do I hear, saith the Lord, seeing that my people is taken away for naught? That they rule over them do howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually all day long is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I even he that spoke, behold, here I am. You're going to know his name? You'll know the true name of the Lord. That's interesting because that's what Zephaniah says as well. And it tells you when. Therefore, wait ye upon me, chapter 3 of Zephaniah, saith the Lord, unto the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn the peoples a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So when does God return the name, restore the name that so many people try to pronounce and when you say Yahweh, Yehovah, Yehuah, and all kinds of names that are out there, you don't even know what the name is. You don't even know how to pronounce the true divine name of, of, uh, of the Lord there. When he spoke to Moses and he spoke to Abraham according to the Syrian gospel, he said, Ihaye Asha Ihaye. You could pronounce it Aye Asha Aye. This was the name that he told Moses. And in fact, it will take Moses to tell you that. That's another prophecy that's never been fulfilled. The question, Moses, oh, I'll go into that in just a moment. I got to take, I got to bring you to that one. Ah, oh, geez. In fact, let's just go to it now. Let's go to it. Exodus. Uh, let's, 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 let's go there. You've got to see what is actually said here. Exodus chapter 3. All right, let me get down to the right part here. Okay. He hid his face because he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, Veyomer Adonai. I have seen the suffering of my people in Egypt. See, and he knows that the taskmasters and what they're suffering. I have come down. That's literally. See? Yored is to come down. Ve'ered is, he says, I have come down, see, to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. El aretz tova u'rachava to a land flowing with milk and honey. El aretz zavar chalav u'davash el mukam hakanani ve'hatid chachiti he goes into the Amorite, the Perizzites, the, the, all the way to the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. Moreover, I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee into Pharaoh, that thou may, mayest bring from, for, forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moshe el ki elecha el paro. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? 
וכי אוציא את בני ישראל ממצרים, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt, ויאמר כי יהיה עמך. And he said certainly, I, that which I will be with you, וזה לך האות כי אנוכי. So he gives him the sign that he's going to be a token that he'll bring them out. But what gets interesting is when Moses, we go further down, And let's see where it is. I want to find exactly where he said. Okay, it's right here in verse 13. And he says, and Moses says unto God, if when I come to the children of Israel, and I will, and they will, uh, excuse me, and, and, and shall say unto them, uh, say unto them, that the God of your fathers has sent me, Eliachem, unto you. Ve'amruli, and they will say to me, Ma'shemo, what is his name? Ma'omer Elohim, what do I say to them? Ve'yomer Elohim el Moshe, Ihaye asha Ihaye, Eye asha Eye, ve'yomer ko... I am that I am has sent you. You know what's interesting is they never asked him, what is your name? Never asked. Hmm. That's why I find that interesting when we read this over here in Isaiah. About the name. Moses knows the name. And that's what we're going to find out. Now let's move on to Zechariah. Uh, I believe this is Zechariah chapter 4. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have seen. A, behold, a golden candlestick, all of gold. Now, you have to remember, this is the reflection that we find over in Revelation 11. Do you remember how it says that these are the two olive branches the two, go, this, let's, let's go back real quick. Uh, let me just jump back and make sure you got it right. All right. These are the two olive trees and the two golden candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, John is clearly identifying Zechariah's prophecy, chapter 4, about this. He said, I've seen, behold, a, a candlestick of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and seven lamps thereon. There are seven pipes, yea, seven to the lamps which are upon the top thereof. Now that's Christ pouring out his spirit. Now two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side of the bowl. They're represented by two olive trees. Okay? Two golden lampstands, two olive trees. You know, in, in Jerusalem, there are two olive trees that are over 2,000 years old right there on the Mount of Olives. Up in the Sea of Galilee as well, uh, olive trees over 2,000 years old. You don't think that Yeshua wasn't praying under these trees? No doubt, they're blessed. And I believe that they're there as a witness of what this scripture says. And I answered and spoke to him, and I asked the angel, spoke with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? The angel that spoke with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he spoke, in, uh, spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by, nor by my power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, Who art thou, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? That thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the stone with shoutings of grace and grace unto it. A stone cut without hands. It's Yeshua. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? Now, we want to get down to where he actually says to him what these two are here. He goes, verse 13, And he answered unto me and said, Knowest thou not what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones. Hmm. What do you know? that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Hmm. The two anointed ones. That's interesting, isn't it? Do you know that 
There's those olive trees I was telling you about. This, this is in Jerusalem. One of them. You can't see the other one. It's back there in the background there. Uh, that's kind of covered up by this one here. But also, when he talks about these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You remember Mount Transfiguration? Again, don't forget now. When Paul says it's appointed a man wants to die, it applies only to Yeshua. Read the chapter again. I can't tell you enough because I know that there's going to be comments like crazy. Oh, it's appointed a man wants to die. Why? Because they don't listen. Don't listen. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. Remember, he is our Lord, right? And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him on either side of the golden lampstand. Here the golden lampstand is there transfigured before them, shining bright like a light, like a lamp should do. And the two olive trees, the two anointed ones, appear showing who they are. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Jeez. All right, now, it comes a day you're going to have to hear Moses and Elijah, okay? But at that time, Yeshua was there. Let all the earth keep silence. Hear him. Right? Now, here comes the next part. They ask him the questions, or the question, why do the scribes say that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall, that's future tense even in the Greek, first come. Future tense. John's dead, by the way. All right, John's already dead. And restore all things. I thought Yeshua restored all things. But Elijah's coming and he's going to restore all things. What's he going to restore? Moses and Elijah are a witness to Yeshua's life on this earth. You don't think they can't restore what he said? Sure they can. Basically, when we come to the restoring is you won't have all the mixed up doctrines from our Gospels with all the different opinions, they'll restore all things. Elijah will restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. That was John. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Do you realize that he literally quotes even from Malachi's prophecy about this? Sure he does. But the interesting thing, when Yeshua quotes and, and quotes Malachi, Remember Malachi, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and shall be proud, yea, all that they do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall leave them neither root nor branch, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. The, let me tell you something. You don't think the Jews don't know that's the Mashiach? And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye, what? The law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. That was ten commandments and two ordinances. On Horeb. Mount Sinai, you get 663 laws. But God says for you to remember these here from Horeb. Look it up. Deuteronomy. There's only ten commandments and two statutes that he gave them. Statutes and judgments. Alright? So Moses is identified in Malachi 4. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Remember, Yeshua comes twice. Isaiah 61, first time is mercy. Second time is judgment. See, that's before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah comes all over again. Then he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, Yeshua actually applies the turning of the heart of the fathers to the children to, to John. And the heart of the, of the fathers was to see the coming of the Mashiach. And he turned their 
father's heart's desire, our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Yosef, he turned our desire of them to the children, and the children rejected it. Not all. There was a remnant that still believed. But he never applied in the heart of the children to their fathers. That's what Elijah and Moses do when they return. They will now turn the children's heart to the longing of the desire of the coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah. All right? That's what that's about. Now, we were talking about there in Matthew about, of course, these two witnesses. Did you know that in Obadiah as well, it speaks about the coming of those two witnesses? Starting with verse 12, this is also speaking about Esau, showing that Esau is Rome. But thou shouldst not have gazed on the day of thy brother in the day of his disaster, neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people. This is Titus, the Roman general, of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldst not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldst thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that escaped. Neither shouldst thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. Now he prophesies and speaks about what would happen that Pope Francis fulfilled back in 2014 during Passover. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, masculine plural, men only, and the Pope only drank with men only his communion. And you shall continually drink the nations, the Gentiles, upon the mountain. Why? Because Revelation 11 says that you will have control for three and a half years. Does it start from that time? I don't think so, but maybe. But in Mount Zion there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a, in a, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them, devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. Alright, now, let's move down to the last verse. We'll do the last two. And the captivity of the hosts of the children of Israel that are among the Canaanites, even in Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem that is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors, Moshaim, okay, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Moshaim, from the word, Mashiach. Or Yeshua, salvation. From the salvation, saviors, deliverers is another way to translate that. Are your two witnesses? All right. Now moving on, Psalm chapter eighty-three. Another verse that clearly identifies the two witnesses. A song of Asaph: O God, keep thou not silence, but hold not thy peace. Hold thy not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head, their leader, their rosh. They hold crafty converse against thy people and take counsel against thy hidden ones, not treasured ones. al Because they know the two witnesses are coming. I know Chuck Missler asked me about this scripture when I first met him years ago. And I told him, Zufanecha are the hidden ones. I said, the only ones that are hidden right now are your two witnesses. How could they counsel against anybody else that's hidden? It's definitely not the house of Israel or the house of Judah. We know who they are. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel might be no more in remembrance. And that's exactly what they're trying to do now. They, they have counseled about these hidden ones because they know that that would bring about a major revival. So they want to figure out what to do with them and then cut the name. Come, cut, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That's the plan, friends. Ezekiel's prophecy also, chapter 38 
as we know the Gog of Magog war, right? Get down to here, and I will call for a sword against him through all my mouth, and saith the Lord, Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him an overflowing shower of great hailstones of fire and brimstone. Again, the ministry of the two witnesses being shown in this day. Now, I said to you, I would show you that Moses never fulfilled everything that God said he would do. Let me share that with you now. Exodus chapter 15. In fact, Rashi, the great Torah commentator, also noted this as well. And that's how I actually learned about this, uh, was when we were doing the documentary, or beginning the process of the documentary for the book that I wrote, Yam Suf. Uh, if you haven't ever read it, you might want to get that book. Very interesting book there, especially the last chapter, my favorite chapter, The Redemption of Israel. But anyway, it says here, and a good friend of mine, a rabbi that's actually in that documentary there, said to me, he says, Rashi quoted Exodus chapter 15 and said that Moses would return in the, in the Messianic age. And here it is. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song to the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted, and the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the city. See, okay, now... This has a different implications in Hebrew. As Yashir Moshe Uvene Israel et Hashira Hazot Ladonai Veyom Ru Le Mor Ashira Ladonai Kiga Ogoa Susvere Kevo Rama Beyom. The singing is a future event. An event that had not happened as of yet. And the horse and his rider is not a singular horse and rider in the day of Moses when he was here. There were 600 horses and riders. Now Pharaoh himself was a type of one of those riders. And he is a type of that rider of revelation that is the same Antichrist spirit that only changes the horse riders as he goes moving down through the time. But Moses will sing that he's gotten victory over the horse and his rider. I'll show you as well, Exodus chapter 34. Notice another scripture. This is after the Ten Commandments, all right? And this is where God speaks to Moses. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. That is prophetic in itself, friend, because the iniquity is pardoned according to Daniel chapter 9 at the coming of the Mashiach, when that prince that is cut off in the midst of the week returns to fill the other half of the week. That's not been fulfilled yet. Okay? That Mashiach, see? And it's an anointed Mashiach, not like the prince that shall come that is, uh, that is not anointed. He is not a Mashiach. He, he is just a prince only. But there is an anointed, a Mashiach that comes. He's cut off in the midst of the week. Even the Talmud writes, my Jewish brothers, the Talmud says that the Messiah must come before the destruction of the second temple. Why? Because they knew Daniel said that the Mashiach would be cut off and not for himself. It happened before the destruction of the second temple. What did we miss? I'm going to show you what you missed in a moment. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. See? Your people. Ose nagelot ashar lo Naviru bechol bechats, all right. But he literally says, uh, "Excuse me, Ose nifalot, I will do wonders, not marvels. Wonders, ashar lo." Nivahu bechol ha'aretz. That has not been seen in all the earth. God is going to do nifalot, wonders, marvelous miracles that has not been seen in all the earth. Do you know the rabbis actually said that they changed it to the word marvels? The rabbis admit it. They changed the translation to marvels because their thinking was that Moses has not done anything greater than the parting of the Red Sea and all the plagues of Egypt. How could he do greater? And God specifically says, it's to Moses, Amcha, your people. See? Ve'yomet hineni anochi. I make a covenant. See? 
Niged, before all Kol Amcha, before all your people. And such, you know, he's going to do wonders. I'm about to do, what does it say there in the last part of the verse? I'm about to do with you. All right? Literally, in Hebrew, he says, I'm about to do it with you. Asha Ata. No one else can fulfill this but Moses himself, and he's not done those miracles as of yet. He's not done, not marvels, but those miracles. Observe thou which I have commanding thee this day. Behold, I am driving out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Let me tell you something. These Nephilim mixed hybrids have to be in the earth today. Because God had already told Moses he wasn't going in the promised land. So Moses couldn't have gone, done those miracles back then. And you can't say that Joshua fulfilled something for Moses when God says he's going to do it with Moses. No wonder why we have them all over again. And of course, don't forget Micah. I'll go back over to Micah's prophecy here because I'm going to show you something in Micah. We'll change the chapter though. Because in Micah chapter 7, also another prophecy of Moses' return. Okay? There shall be a day when they shall come unto thee from Assyria, chapter 7, verse 12, even to the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt even to the river, and from the sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Whoever's got control of Syria and of Egypt is going to be responsible for coming against Israel. And the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because of the fruit of their doings. And they've already made the land desolate from the wars. You're, see, you're there at the time of the prophecy. Then what does he say in verse 14? Ro'e amcha. Feed your people. Not tend thy people. Feed your people. Okay? Shepherd your people. Beshebetecha. With the staff of your heritage. With the DNA that is with inside of you. So when God says about those two witnesses, I will give power unto my two witnesses. I told you they're already here. They have to be here because he gives them the power. He didn't say I'm going to send them down and give them power. He says I will give power. So they have to already be here. More than likely two people anointed. Because in this case here, tend thy people with the staff of thy heritage, or the flock of thy heritage. Sion, nechaledecha, shechani, lavadod. See? Of the gen your generations. This staff that he feeds them with is what's in his own genetics. It's in his DNA. It's been passed down from one to another, to another, to another, to another. And the anointing that laid upon Moses will be again, as we see in the case of Elisha with Elijah. You remember how Elijah, when he finds Elisha, he's plying behind 12 yoke of oxen. That's, a, that's actually 24 cows, but it's 12 yoke of oxen, representing the 12 tribes of Israel and showing that they are all in bondage. And the mantle passes from Elijah to Elisha. And the spirit or the anointing that was on Elijah was upon Elisha. I think that's what you'll have with your two witnesses. That that's the conjecture. They could both come back themselves. I have no idea. And don't get this whole idea of this appointed who wants to die. Get over that one. You need to go read it again. It's about Yeshua only. And by the way, those of you that believe in a rapture, how in the world are you all going to come back and die as well? Okay? So think about the logic of the argument. Because most people that believe that actually believe in a rapture as well. And that makes no sense. And there is a hiding away of his children. It's in the Old Testament. Plain as day that he will hide us in the day of his wrath. Not in man's wrath, but in his wrath. Mm. Blessed be the Lord. And this, this, the, the miracles that Moses does when he comes to lead his people with the staff of his own, uh, feed his own people, he, he says there when God does these, again, not marvelous things as they write in here, as in the days I coming forth out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him, him, marvelous things, Nephilot, wonders I'll show him. The nation shall see and be put to shame for all their might. In other words, they got nuclear bombs and everything else, and yet this man can do more with a stick inside of his body, his own DNA. He can do more with that than what you can do with your nuclear weapons. 
You put your hands over your mouth, all the nations will. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth and their ears shall be deaf. Mm. It is amazing to me. We did Psalm here, Psalm 83. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come into the children of Israel, they shall say, okay, we already did this one here as well. I'm going to take you to one last thing, but in closing, let me come back though and remind you of Rabbi Glazerson's own, his own code here that he did. Me, Mishachim, who are the anointed ones? It says here, Mashiach, the Messiah, Yehuah, or Jehovah, as you try to say in English, we don't know what the real pronunciation is. The Lord, Ba, ba comes. The Messiah of the Lord comes. With Elijah, Im Eliyahu, uh, to Israel, La Yisrael, with Moses. That's who your anointed ones are. That's who they are. Moses and Elijah's own code clearly identifies who they are. All right. Now, I want to show you my Jewish brothers and sisters that are that are, that'll watch this, and there are many Israelis that watch this channel, friends. Many of them. I want to share with you um, a passage from Psalm chapter. I believe it's Psalm fifty. Psalm chapter 50. The Lord just revealed this to me to the other day. I had no idea that the identity of the Messiah was hidden in Psalm chapter 50. I have to see if I can find the right place again. And again, this, this is very, very difficult here. Hear, O my people, I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. God thy God am I. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices and thy burnt offerings are continually before me. That's interesting that he says that because he is, they are reproved by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea. They all reprove them for their sacrifices because they said God desired mercy, not sacrifice. I will take no bullock out of thy house nor he goats out of thy folds. That's very important. The Lord thy God will provide for himself a sacrifice. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? He asked that question. Offer unto God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's the sacrifice He wants. And pay thy vows unto the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you. Thou shalt honor me. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to, to declare in my statutes? And that thou hast taken my covenant in thy mouth. He's actually addressing this prophetically of the rabbis of the day when Yeshua was walking the earth. Seeing thou hatest instruction and casteth my words behind you. When you saw a thief, thou hadst company with him and with adulterers with thy portion. You took Barabbas. You took the company of the thief. You took also with adulterers with thy portion. The Maccabee brothers married into Israel that of Rome. That's the adulterous part that Israel did, instead of trusting in the Lord. Thou hast let loose thy mouth for evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. You falsely accused your own Messiah. You sit and speakest against thy brother, which was Yeshua, and thou slanderest thine own mother's son. Mary, you claim that she 
had an illegitimate child. As the scripture bears record against you, they said, did we not tell you that he has a devil and he has a Samaritan? Samaritans were the children of Israel that were brought about by Roman soldiers that birthed, that raped the Israeli women. These things hast thou done, and should I have kept silence? Thou hast thought I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove you and set the cause before thine eyes. Remember, as the Bible said, even prophesied of Yeshua that he would keep silence and not open his mouth a word. But he says, I will set the cause before your eyes. Let me remind you where that cause will be set and how it will be set before your eyes. And this is for the house of Judah, that this is the case. Zechariah chapter 12. In that day, Saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. Again, a single rider. That's who Moses is coming against. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and I will smite every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the chief of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength through the Lord of hosts their God. And that day I will make the chiefs of Judah like a pan of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire among the sheaves, and they shall devour all the peoples round about. On the right hand and on the left, Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. And the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem be not magnified above Judah. Because even though the house of Israel, many of you are believers in Yeshua, again, as we brought out at the very beginning of this message, there's so much idolatry, so much division, that even God, according to Ezekiel chapter 36, has to straighten out that mess as well. He goes on to say, though, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me because they have thrust him through, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one in the bitterness for his firstborn. You will look upon the very one that you allowed the Roman government that you put yourself under, even as you are under the Roman government today in Israel. You will look upon the very one that they thrust through as it prophesied of here in Psalm, and set thy cause before thine eyes. I will reprove you and set the cause before your eyes. This is when Daniel chapter 9 will be fulfilled. This is when the prophecy of Zechariah will be fulfilled. When they look upon him that was thrust through. Some believe it's this piercing of his hands and his feet, and I suppose you could take it that way. The thrust through is that sword that went into his side. And we all bear that responsibility. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live and Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you. Remember us in your giving. If the Lord lays that upon your heart, shalom.